The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. We're pleased to have with us today Delegate Joe Preston. Good to see you, sir. Thank you for having me, Woody. Well, congratulations on your election. How is it being a new member of the House of Delegates? Oh, it's a lot of fun. I've been, <laughs> been uh, uh, a lot of people have been telling me a lot of jokes and war stories about what it's like to be here. But it's been a very enlightening experience, and people have been very open and very gracious and very welcoming to me since I've been here. And I've been very happy about that. I heard rumors about the dissension between the, you know, both sides of the aisle and how people weren't, uh, you know, very cordial. But that has been completely a, a myth, and I'm happy that it has been a myth. And people People from both sides of the aisle have been just extremely welcoming to me, and again, I, I'm appreciative of that. Great. Tell us, tell us about your district in terms of its geographic makeup and the demographics. Well, as you know, each member of the House represents approximately 81,000 persons. Uh, my district is uh, fairly unique in that it includes the entire city of Petersburg, which is uh, approximately 31,000 people. Uh, but then it's surrounded by four other jurisdictions, and I represent a little piece of each one of those jurisdictions. That would be uh, Dinwiddie County, which is the mm -hmm. largest, uh, the second largest part of my district. Uh, I have actually about 40 percent of Dinwiddie County uh, is in my district, and uh, out of that 40 percent of Dinwiddie County, probably 40 percent of that is agricultural. So I have a big agricultural uh, part to my district. In addition to Dinwiddie County, I also represent represent a portion of Prince George County, uh, a portion of uh, Chesterfield County, uh, specifically the uh, counties of Ettrick and Matoka, and then finally I represent uh, a little piece of uh God, I mentioned Dinwiddie, <laughs> I right. mentioned Prince George, I mentioned uh, Hopewell, city of Hopewell. Okay. I have a little piece of Hopewell, yes. Okay, and what about the diversity of your constituents? Uh, well, actually, my district is fairly uh, uh, heavily populated African-American district. It's probably one of the heaviest populated African-American districts in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, I would say it's at least about 42% uh, African-American district, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a diverse district. Uh, again, we have a good mix of business and, uh, and, and, and uh, non-business uh, people in my district, and uh, it's an interesting mix. We also have the presence of Fort Lee in my, it's near mm -hmm. my district. It's not specifically mm -hmm. in my district, but it sits right there adjacent to my district and we all know the contribution that Fort Lee continues to make to our area as a whole and of course we also are right next to the Rolls-Royce plant that was recently established there and I think call it the Commonwealth Center for Advanced Manufacturing which is a conglomerate of all these high-tech companies from around the nation that are right there on the edge of my district so it's not specifically in my district but I kind of have adopted it because it, uh, it has a great impact on what happens sure. in my district. And how's the economy in your district? Uh, it has not been the best. Uh, we're very pleased about what Governor McAuliffe was able to do by bringing the Unotayo company to uh, Petersburg. Uh, you may not know, but we recently uh, were told that a uh, major corporate entity, the Boringer Chemical Company, had decided to leave Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And that they had just spent over $100 million uh, to renovate their, their local plant. And we were shocked that they decided to leave. But we were very, very fortunate to have a governor who's a go-getter, a high-energy guy. He's a businessman. He understands what it takes to get companies to come here, and he landed a major coup for my district in bringing the Unitile Company to Petersburg. That company is going to create almost 390 jobs. These are good-paying jobs, and I understand that the expansion is going to be uh, down the road shortly after that, and they're going to create even more jobs, so we're really pleased about that. As you know, Petersburg still has one of the highest unemployment rates in the state. Uh, we do have a, a, a high teen pregnancy problem there, and so the economy could be much better there, but uh, uh, things are on the upswing. There's a lot of corporate investment going on in Petersburg right now, uh, and we're hoping that that's all going to 
uh, lend itself toward jump, jump starting our economy. Uh, last week it was announced that uh, we're going to have a, a major uh, brewery established in Petersburg. Mm -hmm. It's gonna, actually going to be the second largest producer in the state after the uh, plan is completed in about two years. And so we, it's, 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 it's those type of investments that we think long term will begin to help us turn our economy around. But Petersburg certainly needs some help and uh, we're open for any assistance that uh, people want to bring to there. It's a lovely community. It's one of the most historic places in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We have buildings in downtown Petersburg that you won't find anywhere else in the nation. Talk to us about some of those buildings. Well, as you know, we've had uh, several films uh, being made in Petersburg right. recently. Obviously, this is not just what I have recognized. People like Steven Spielberg, mm -hmm. people like Meg Ryan, they have come to our community and they see the natural resources that are just sitting here waiting to be used. And obviously, the old Civil War buildings and the history of this community has lent itself greatly to uh, the aspirations of many Hollywood writers, and that's to make movies about the Civil War and about our, our first presidents and the founding fathers of this nation. So so Petersburg has really, really benefited uh, from having that, that, that historic past, and that's something we hope to continue building on. Now, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned an icon of African-American history, Thurgood Marshall, who was the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. You're a practicing attorney yourself. What does that nexus mean to you, especially in this month of February? Well, let me just tell you that I have a very special connection to Thurgood Marshall and many others. I'm a graduate of his alma mater, the Howard University School of Law. And my mentor in the city of Petersburg was a gentleman by the name of Robert H. Cooley III. Uh, Robert H. Cooley III was the only African-American to pass the Virginia State Bar in 1931. He was a friend and a colleague and classmate of Thurgood Marshall. And he told me the story about Thurgood Marshall being very frustrated with the Howard University School of Law. And he had actually given notice that he was going to withdraw and return to the city of Baltimore and pursue his legal education somewhere else. But uh, Mr. Cooley got to Thurgood and, and explained to Thurgood and, and expressed to Thurgood how much the university needed him and his abilities and his good name and reputation. And he convinced Thurgood to stay. And a lot of people don't know that story, but I've been told that story, and I believe it. And so uh, I'm happy to say that this month means a lot to me because of the contributions that Thurgood and people like Robert H. Cooley, who obviously did never, never received the recognition that Thurgood Marshall uh, currently enjoys, but mm -hmm. certainly he was a soldier in the Civil Rights Movement, a personal friend and advocate with Oliver Hill and mm -hmm. Spotswood Robinson and Sam Tucker. These were the gentlemen who fought battles that uh, certainly that helped me be where I'm at today. So I'm really happy about that connection to Thurgood Marshall. Now, how are your schools doing, your, your, your local schools? Well, as you know, Petersburg has had some very special problems with our school system, but we've got a great superintendent in place now, Dr. Joseph Melvin. Uh, he's got some really great, great ideas. Uh, he is working now closely with uh, Secretary Ann Holton, the Secretary of Education, mm -hmm. and the governor is also committed to continuing to try to prove uh, our schools. Uh, it's going to take a multidisciplinary approach, of course. There's no one solution to the problem, but uh, one of the things we want to do is uh, get our parents more involved back into mm -hmm. the, uh, the, their, 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 their children's lives with the school system. We want to uh, continue to educate our local school boards about, uh, particularly in our underperforming uh, uh, areas, about the continued need for them to be educated and for them to let the superintendent manage the school and not micromanage uh, the schools uh, so much. Uh, another approach, uh, we want to try to teach increased pay for teachers who choose to serve underprivileged communities like, uh, like Petersburg. We know that uh, our teachers Teachers work probably three or four times as hard as teachers who don't have to deal with the type of background and the problems that so many of our students bring to the classroom with this. So I know that the governor and others are beginning to study how we can begin to reward teachers who stay and work with our underperforming schools. But Petersburg does have some problems. It's getting better. Uh, it was announced last night at the Chamber of Commerce that our high school is now 100 percent fully accredited, Great. and we're very happy about that. Our other schools are, are, are on, the, on the upswing, and uh, this year we've gotten some legislation before the General Assembly, which is going to change how schools are graded. Uh, you know, many of our schools are, 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 are reaching some really, really high benchmarks, but because they have not reached the ultimate benchmark right. in order to receive an A or a B, it doesn't look like the, school, the, the schools are performing. Right. And so we're going to try to change the uh, gradation system so that we can begin to reward schools who have shown market improvement, even though they may not have reached the ultimate benchmark. And so th though that's another tool that we're going to uh, try to employ to try to begin to improve our school system. But there's uh, so many different things that we're, we're, we're doing. I'm glad to know that we do have a commitment from the government, governor and the Secretary of Education to really focus on Petersburg uh, because we think that our school system can justify some very special uh, help. 
it's interesting you uh, mentioned that grading system of, of local school districts. Uh, I believe a, a bill that passed the General Assembly last year saw its uh, death this year. That was the uh, bill that would have required school districts to be graded on an A to F scale. Uh, I take it a lot of people uh, did not like that scale, at least. I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, again, the scale it doesn't really reflect the gains that many mm -hmm. of our schools are making and it almost penalizes those schools because when you look at the grade that's all you have there right. uh, so we want to come up with a system that's a little fair and maybe a little bit more informative and I think it would help all of us uh, as we continue to develop strategies to try to improve our school system and there was another bill that was declared unconstitutional this year by a court in Roanoke that would have allowed the state to take over a quote unquote failing school uh, schools still need help, as, as you've rightly recognized, but uh, I think uh, the state constitution is structured in a way that just wouldn't allow this piece of legislation. I agree, and I was not a, uh, in favor of a takeover. Uh, in fact, uh, um, I was a little disappointed that some of our local legislators actually supported a takeover of our local public school, particularly uh, when the takeover was going to come from a school that adjoins our school district. I thought that was sort of putting uh, two friends against each other and uh, and I think that lent itself to people not really want to even be open to the ideal about a takeover. I don't think a takeover is, is, is the way to go. I don't think people who are from outside our district understand the special problems and the needs of our district and so I was just against a takeover and most of my constituents were against it as well. I, I knew it was going to result in litigation and it did mm -hmm. and I think the courts got have it right. I think that's their local school board issues and not necessarily a takeover issue from the top down. So. Now, you serve on the Education Committee, and all of these issues flow through there. Uh, the, the other issue that has flowed through that committee this year and last year are the standards of learning and the need to reform them. D were you hearing a lot about uh, those standards uh, during the course of your campaign? Uh, you know, I did, and I can tell you that uh, the standards of learning are still under review. It's something that we're all looking at every year because apparently there's been a rigidity attached to it that has not given uh, teachers the flexibility uh, or, or nor the students the flexibility uh, to possibly fail and maybe come back and take the test quickly uh, because of the way that the uh, SOLs are set up. Um, um, they need to be, uh, the standards need to be tweaked a little bit to give uh, everyone a little bit more flexibility. Again, when you have one size fits all, you're always going to have a problem where people that don't meet that criteria they get either left behind or they fall through the cracks and so uh, yes that was an issue on the campaign it's been a little less so since I've been here mm -hmm. although I know that uh, they are looking at it on a regular basis now uh, talk to us about uh, the community colleges that are in your district and other institutions of higher learning well, we have two main ones. We have uh, Virginia State University, where mm -hmm. I'm also an adjunct professor, and I'm always very supportive of the uh, role that that school plays in our community and has played uh, since it has been established. Uh, I tell people that the last time we had an African-American lawyer serve in this district, in the House of Delegates, it was the person who established Virginia State University, is that right? uh, Alfred Harris. That is correct. Uh, and so I didn't promise anybody that I would <laughs> be able to establish Virginia State University, but I am committed to making sure that that university stays vital. It's, it, it's vital and that it gets the support from this, this body uh, that, that it can. Uh, we also have uh, Richard Bland College in our community. I'm a former mm -hmm. uh, member of their foundation board and I'm very uh, proud to say that I was instrumental in helping Richard Bland College raise money to have dormitories on their campus. It is the only junior college in the state that provides uh, junior college students with a real life uh, four-year college experience their first two mm -hmm. years so that when they make that transition from junior college to college it's an easier fit uh, they're not uh, it's nothing new living away from home and uh, having being responsible in that way and so it has really been not only a great recruiter for Richard Bank College but the, it has been nothing but a positive uh, thing I think a lot of people thought initially it was designed to compete with Virginia State University those schools serve two different missions for the most part uh, and, and, and two different populations of students that they go after and so uh, I'm very proud of both of those schools and they're doing very well right now. Of course, you, everybody's heard about the problems that Virginia State University mm -hmm. had last year. That was not solely Virginia State University's fault. It mm -hmm. had a, a lot to do with the change in the federal law which uh, made a lot of students ineligible for financial aid that had been previously I eligible see. for it. Uh, but this year, uh, according to what I've read in the paper, uh, the enrollment is actually up there and the numbers are, are, are pretty solid and apparently the school appears to be on pretty good footing right now and uh, we just received a couple of major donations. I know uh, uh, Thompson Hospitality, I believe in Northern Virginia business, just uh, donated another $200,000 to Virginia State University. So people 
people are recognizing the needs of the school and understanding its importance and I, I'm thinking things are going to be okay at VSU. I don't want to say that too loudly because we need all the help that we can get, uh, but those two institutions serve vital roles in, in, in my district and uh, one of the things that I hope to develop with both institutions, uh, if I'm allowed to continue on as a representative uh, for my district, I'd like to get some workforce development, development. training programs going at both those schools. Uh, the one group of of persons that are consistently left out are people who don't really have aspirations of going to college. Mm -hmm. And these are smart people. These are people that can learn job skills like anybody else. But because there's no uh, program that they can go into, they get a certification from, uh, right. many times their job skills are questioned and they can't even get in the door. Uh, and so uh, around the state, apparently they have many mm -hmm. workforce training programs, but they've, uh, come under a, they've come under a lot of criticism, mainly because the schools don't seem to be uh, training students with that specific kind of skills that they can use to go right out from that program and become employed. And so uh, I know that the governor has been talking about tweaking all these workforce development programs. My ideal is to go directly to a major manufacturer like Unitile who is coming into the area. Have us take, have Unitile take me and the other persons who want to develop this workforce training program. Take us into your plant and show us exactly what you need to have done. Show mm -hmm. us the skills that we need to be able to impart to future employees. We will take the burden and train these employees. And at the end of a 10 or 12 week program, because we want the programs to be not more than three months, mm -hmm. that we can give these persons a certificate. And that certificate will mean to this company that this person can do this job in the company and get the commitment from the business that they would at least employ a person that comes with this certificate and give them that opportunity. We think it will save the company money. Uh, we think it would really begin to help a lot of people who can be employed, but just for some reason are not able to go to college. Um, and so I'm, I'm very much in favor of these workforce training programs. And I want it to be for low tech workers, workers who are, are not that savvy with with uh, internet technology, but mm -hmm. people who can be trained. And so I think we're missing a big opportunity uh, because there's so many people out here who need a job. And if they had any type of certificate to show that they've dedicated to learning this, this type of job skill, uh, I think it would just be a win for all of us involved. And so I'm really hoping that we can get that going in the next uh, year. Yeah, that's, that's a great initiative, especially for uh, youngsters, be they men or women, who want to uh, get a certificate so that they can uh, be a productive member of society. It's also a good tool for adults who lost employment and need to be retrained. Absolutely. Absolutely, Woody. Absolutely. And I, it's really dear to my heart. And uh, fortunately, I, I just got here on January the 14th. I've been so busy here. I really not hate had much time to even get back to the district and to fellowship with my constituents because this job is very, very demanding and uh, being here on a short session, of course, you just have to come in and you have to work really hard to, tr to try to get something accomplished. Uh, I'm very happy to say that I came in and I, I submitted 13 bills, uh, which I told I was crazy to do because I'm a freshman here and freshmen aren't supposed to uh, create a lot of legislation, but, you know, I came here to work and so I was sincere with my 13 bills and they, they covered a lot of different things. Uh, they were not uh, focused in any one particular area. I had some voting right bills uh, uh, to restore uh, a felon's rights automatically. It seems to me that no matter what crime a person commits, if they've paid their debt to society, they should not continue to be uh, labeled uh, where they cannot vote, a basic constitutional right. And my bill didn't survive very long, but I understand there's a Senate bill that's very similar to my bill that is still alive, and I will support that. Uh, I also had legislation that, uh, that uh, attempted to uh, deal with these payday lenders. Petersburg is a, mm -hmm. is a fiscally stressed community and we've got, you know, eight or nine payday lenders on one uh, location in our area and uh, they need to be regulated in my opinion a little bit more. Uh, the interest rates and the, the type of monies that they make off of people who really don't have a lot of money is just incredible. If you looked at the numbers it would be shocking to most people and uh, I tried to at least rein them in a little bit by giving the locality. I had a, some uh, a piece of legislation that would give the localities to the ability to regulate the number of them uh, at a minimum but uh, unfortunately I didn't get the support that I needed for that for that bill. But I do have three bills that are still alive. Um, uh, one is the bill that I mentioned earlier about, I, I don't know if I mentioned it on camera, but I have a bill to require at least two weeks notice uh, in any special election. Yeah, that came out of your experience uh, running for office, did it not? It did. Talk to us about those circumstances. Well, let me just say that um, uh, I came here by way of a special election whereby we were given notice on Thanksgiving Day. The public was giving notice on Thanksgiving Day that we were going to have an election to determine who the Democratic Party nominee would be on Monday. 
less than four days notice to the public. It's, I just, although I, I ended up winning the special election, I'm the beneficiary of it, it was the most undemocratic thing I think I've ever been involved with in my life. I just didn't think it was fair that the public should be subjected to four days notice to make a decision about who would represent their interests here at the General Assembly. It's far too important of a job to uh, leave it to political insiders to manipulate the process. And so uh, I vow that if I got elected, one of the things I would do is try to make sure that it didn't happen to anybody else again. And so my very first bill that uh, I initiated was uh, House Bill 1971, which is a bill to uh, have a minimum of two weeks notice for any special election to the House or to the Senate of the Virginia General Assembly. I think it's a good bill. It came out of the House uh, with no opposition at the subcommittee or the full committee level, and it appeared to be on its way of coming out of the Senate, uh, but there was a technical tweak. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the bill did just that, and so uh, the bill is going to come up today on the floor, and I understand there's going to be an amendment, and hopefully the uh, Senate has expressed their willingness to let this bill come out. They all agree that it's a good thing. And the only uh, downside was that the registrars uh, at least expressed to me when the bill was working its way through the House, they didn't think it was enough time, two weeks. They thought maybe mm. 30 days. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to put anything out there that would appear to be partisan. I just thought two weeks at a minimum for uh, an election to an office such as this uh, would be required. So I'm real happy about that. Yes. Uh, talk to us a little bit more about the restoration of civil rights. It not, not only involves the, the critical right to vote, but there are other consequences that flow from that because uh, you're not eligible for certain government serv services, for example, if your rights aren't restored. Talk to us about that impact. Well, again, you know, there's a, there, for some reason there's a, a group of legislators who just I apparently want to make a person who has served their time and who've gone through the process go through some additional steps in order to get their rights restored. And to me, it's just another bureaucracy that's been created here because, as you know, the governor has, has reinstated over 5,000 uh, persons' voting rights. As a matter of fact, I think he's on uh, pace to probably have restored more rights than any other governor prior to him, and he's only in his second year. Uh, and so uh, it just seems to me that we really don't need that intermediary, intermediary process. Uh, the rights are too important. Uh, obviously, you don't have a right to possess a firearm uh, if you get your rights restored, but it does restore some of your other rights, and it does make you eligible for some government services again. And it's, it's just, it just seems to me the right thing to do. I mean, what more does a person have to do after they pay their debt to society uh, where they should not be returned to, their, to the, have their, their, their rights restored to them? So, I'm a, of course, uh, people say that's a very liberal ideal. I just think it's a very fair ideal. And uh, I'm a very forgiving person. I just think that people who have, have uh, made a mistake and have paid the price, they deserve to be, uh, you know, part of society again. And so... Um, I'm going to continue to fight that fight, and hopefully down the road we can, we can get the law changed. Now, you also have some legislation dealing with the regulation of uh, red light traffic uh, intersections with, with cameras? Yes, and let me tell you about that bill. And, and again, this was one of the bills that I put forth in reaction to constituents' complaints about the lights being in my district. And what we discovered, and even legislative services admits this, is that the bill that I proposed was actually already the law. However, the bill needs to be tweaked. Um, the current uh, red light law requires that uh, localities that use them uh, have to have posted somewhere on the light the fact that this is a camera-controlled mm -hmm. intersection. What they don't address is how conspicuous that sign I must see. be. In Petersburg, and I'm only speaking for the two uh, red light cameras in my immediate district, uh, the signs are so small you literally don't know that they exist. However, Richmond, to the, con to the contrary, has a completely different, they have a sign that is so large, you can actually see it from about 500 yards away. And so I want to advocate that all signs across the Commonwealth of Virginia be at least large enough to be seen from approximately 500 yards away. Because again, not really having a good sign there is almost tantamount to not having a sign there. And so once my, my legal assistant, who was a young lawyer, and it's good to have a lot of lawyer work because right. we all lawmakers, she picked up on that. I missed it. Legislative services missed it. But she came into my office. She says, Delegate Preston, I believe that this is already the law, this bill that we have. And she was correct. And so I had to table my bill. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to forget about the changes that I want to make next year. Uh, as you know, if your bills, once you reach a, a certain deadline, you cannot submit any other legislation until next year. So mm -hmm. I'm way beyond that deadline. But I, I do plan to address uh, the size issue in, uh, in some legislation next year. Talk to us about uh, the critical nature of your service on health, welfare, and institutions. You've got a district that probably has a, a lot of health care needs. And we do, and, and one of the big issues that came up this year was the issue of certificate of public need. Mm -hmm. uh, that, if, for those of, of, of 
people who don't know what a certificate of public need is, apparently when a hospital or, or any uh, medical provider wants to uh, bring in a certain amount of equipment or spend a certain amount of dollars to expand their facility, they have to go through a process of getting it approved. Uh, and the approval process is, quote, a certificate of public need. And uh, the reason why that this exists is to, to make sure that um, people are not running people out of certain areas through competition and one person's not coming in manipulating the area with a lot of resources and taking health care away from other areas. To, but to make a long story short, it was really an issue this year about whether or not the certificate of public need statute, as it exists, should be changed to allow hospitals to begin to do some things without having to go through this laborious process. Um, and uh, apparently there was a, um, a lot of debate on both sides of the issue, and I believe they agreed to study it this year. Um, and then they came back with another bill that would allow them to tweak it a little bit until they complete this study. So sure. I'm not sure how that's going to come out of the Senate all the way uh, at this time, but uh, that has been a big issue, the certificate of public need. Uh, people argue that if we uh, allowed the certificate of public need to go away, uh, it would actually reduce access to health care uh, by poor people and, mm -hmm. uh, and minorities uh, because the, the feeling was that uh, if we deregulate these hospitals too much, uh, only people that have resources will come in and set up and they will only want to deal with people that have resources and not people who are Medicaid recipients, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that was just one issue. But being on a health welfare institution, that's a committee that covers you know, all of your hospitals, all of your uh, medical issues. It also covers your psychiatric facilities. And so you, there's a myriad of issues that come across, uh, that, come across that committee. And so I'm, I'm happy to be on that committee. It's a very good committee, but uh, it does require a lot of work. Now, uh, Medicaid expansion is effectively dead again for, for this session, but, yes. but uh, what's your opinion on, on the need to expand Medicaid? Oh, I'm very disappointed in that. Obviously, we're, we're, we're foregoing almost two and a half billion dollars every year of money that we've already paid into the system. I'm disappointed again that we have not expanded health uh, uh, Medicaid. It's something that needs to be done. Uh, we are actually subsidizing the other states in the nation who have taken uh, the uh, the expanded health care dollars. And uh, I don't know what the long-term solution is. It's our budget's busting. We're cutting, you know, there's, we're complaining about the amount of money that we can give our teachers for raises because I've, you know, 2% is just, the governor has actually advocated 2% and uh, we hope we can get that, but uh, I would advocate for 10%. Our teachers are certainly underpaid. They haven't gotten a, a real good raise in a long time. Uh, uh, we're cutting our law enforcement budgets. Uh, it's all because of uh, the uh, pressure that not ex accepting these, these federal dollars is putting on our budget. Um, I, I understand there is a different point of view, but I disagree with it. I mean, we already get almost 30 percent of our budget from the federal government. Virginia is probably the number one state in the country that gets federal dollars because of all of the defense work that we do here and all of the uh, military uh, the presence that we have here. So to say that you know, to accept the Medicare, the government may fail in two years. It's just not a very sound argument, in my opinion. Um, and I'm hopeful, uh, and I have not taken a look at the plan that the other side of the aisle has just recently put forward. I mean, it's been, a, uh, as of 2015, a plan. Uh, before it was no, no, no. Now it's no, and here's our plan. And so the plan is under review right now. I have not had a chance to take a look at it, uh, but I know that it will not expand health care to the 400,000 citizens of Virginia that, that, that need to have it. Uh, I do know that the governor put forth his GAP proposal this year. He did put $200 million back in the budget, and uh, it doesn't look like that's going to go very far. Great. Well, it's been a pleasure having you here, Delegate. Uh, Thank you for Good luck me. in your uh, freshman year, Delegate Joe Preston. Thank you for having me, Woody. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Comcast, connecting Virginians to their government. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans.